<laughs> and if we remember that religion, I know it's for you. <laughs> Sunday morning, let us remember that religion means to link up, and so let's imagine that we're all linking up to relink up. And that's where, oh, they're going in droves. So this is fine. <laughs> it gives us more space. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Stephen and I do run an adolescent program in Auckland, which is not in Europe. Well, <laughs> I didn't think it was in Europe for a long, long time. Apparently England's not in Europe, so it's all a little bit geographically challenged at the moment. So uh, we'll, we'll introduce ourselves. Right, um, my name is Jenny. Copeland and I'm from Sweden. I've been involved with adolescence since 1989 when I was part of a group that started the very first adolescent well, program, I suppose we need to say here, yeah, environment in Sweden. And it was a bit tricky, and I can talk about that. You would like to talk about that. But we didn't really say it was a Montessori adolescent program as such. We call it, this is our adolescent program for those who have come out of our Montessori school because we found that we hadn't fully explored, yet explored, what it took to create a Montessori environment for the third play. And we didn't know that much about the third play. And in Europe in those days, it was really difficult to find someone that you could visit who actually had done this. And the only place to go then for me was across the Atlantic to see what they were doing in North America. So can we find out who are you? That would be useful for us as well. Yeah. How many people are closely connected to an existing adolescent program, please? Can you put out your hand just so we can see? Thank you. And how many of those are administrators? How many are sort of the decision makers group? We'll just talk to you. That's <laughs> no, not at all. And how many are people who are considering or wanting to be part of perhaps a monthly adolescent program? And this is something there. And are there other groups that I've missed? Are there other people's representations here? You may parents. parents come to the wrong room. Yeah. <laughs> parents, anybody or other? Yes, I'm a state secondary worker, I'm a state secondary teacher, and I'm trained in any talk of early childhood and elementary. We've got to not go to Sydney trained right. in what we would call secondary. Lovely. <laughs> And a very lovely place to start is the connection between the early childhood and adolescence is enormous. We see this in the phase development, but also we see it in so many other approaches and the ways that we work with these new new beings coming through. So the second birth, if you like, of 12 years old um, creates that parallel um, for the new human being. So to welcome everybody here, and the format of today is just a question and everybody can answer, and another person's question and everybody can answer, and we'll try to curate that. Will that meet everybody's needs? Is that okay? <coughs> Just as some people have come in a bit later, we do encourage people if you've got transport or even if you're feeling a bit bored, please just slip out. <coughs> We're very happy for you not to feel uncomfortable about that. <coughs> come in, come in. So, uh, the first thing when I think about networking, I really want us to think that we're not getting married to another school. Because getting married to somebody means that you share the vision, you share a lot in common, you like each other, and it's really important that you find a way of working together. I think networking is better viewed as a sibling relationship. You don't have to agree. You, you find things that you respect about something else, another school or your sibling. You find you know things that don't do as well as you do. You know things that you they do better than you do, and you accept that. But you're not in a competition relationship. Neither are you in a, a, a partnership relationship. Because I think a lot of tensions and fractions come when two institutions try to work together, but they don't see things our way. And maybe our first statement is, let's all see things differently. Especially when we're working with adolescents, I think it's really helpful to have that as a basis to accept lots and lots of different points of view. So I think it's important to say there's no one right way. Yeah, I, I, I can... And having said that, um, 
through, it's my experience through the work that I have been involved in and the adolescent environments I've been involved in that it has also been very important to talk shop with other practitioners because you are rather alone doing what you're doing. And especially if you start something that is totally new in your country or in your region or in your town or for your school, you really need the support of others. And I have found, and I can tell you about the experiences I have. So, so we have, so I made it my business, first of all, to find people who work in adolescent Montessori, adolescent environments. And then we have come together to share what we understand as the Montessori principles that are true for the third plane and how they can be implemented in our environment where we are with our students. Because I think by nature, the, the, you know, the, it, the adolescent community will look different because you are different and, and where you are, there is, might be a cultural difference and, and your students are different. But what makes it Montessori and what keeps us together, there is, has to be some kind of glue. And that those are the Montessori core principles <coughs> that we know are true for the third play and how we best can implement them in our environment where we are. There sometimes there's some guilt associated with Montessori teaching. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it as the book tells me. I don't, my school doesn't look like the videos that we see. And that guilt sometimes leads to shame, and that means that we sometimes cover up our failures and make it look like it's going really, really well. But actually, we need to discuss the failures as well to say this totally isn't working, or I can't get this to work at this group of people with this situation. Um, this this idea doesn't seem to be working. We've just heard that Montessori yourself went to things um, to buy this tool because we're through so many iterations as to keep on uh, keep on trying, experimenting with what does work, and that's what we're trying to find. Has anyone got the perfect answer, please? Before this comes, <laughs> <laughs> know the right answer. Mm. Has anyone got a question? like to, that is a burning question for you about adolescence, secondary, Montessori, Europe, network. Go. Um, I'm interested to know in, in your established schools how you, um, how, how you approach the issue of attrition through the school, because obviously we, we've had the problem where we started our um, elementary program and we brought in some children from outside to the school because they some join when they're older. And I have wanted really to be obstinate violence against staff telling me, oh, it just isn't working because they're not normalized. Oh, these kids, they didn't have Montessori from birth, so they're not normalized. And I, it drives me crazy because I'm like, well, what's the point in what we're doing if we don't catch the child as they shoot out of the uterus then? <laughs> 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 but really, like, there's yeah. like, these kids can't come to Montessori school because they get Montessori from there. So, how on earth, like, and my question is, how, how can I have an adolescent program when, as the children get older and older, parents, uh, every, every family has a different point where they go, <coughs> education to get serious now, and I pick this alternative option, and now my kid needs the real world. But, uh, I mean, I, I, no matter how much I tell them what, what do you think we're doing, <laughs> they, they still, oh, but what about, oh, I need to sit exams. And, so we have like three kids who next year could start an adolescent program and the parents would like it, but obviously we need to work out how that is going to, how where will we find their peer group? Um, and I really passionately feel like I would work, like to work with kids who haven't necessarily had the monster. So let's answer the attrition question. Sorry, let's like, yes, see what, the attrition question, like question leads us. And part of the question is the laterals. People coming in sideways into Montessori, and that seems to be a bit of a question. <laughs> Has anybody got an insight into that? Are there any people who say absolutely no way should anybody who not Montessori come into a school, or is anybody going to say uh, we shouldn't take any Montessori kids? We totally need naturals come in. Are there any extreme points of view in the room? Well, that's a good answer to start with. I, everybody understands we're on a spectrum. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we have a school of 120 students, age 16 to 19, but we 
which 119 have no previous books. <coughs> Yay! Thank you. We have to start somewhere. There's no middle school or elementary in our town, so start there and just make a you know easy transition for them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that example. And there are lots of examples. I can say from the from the trip that we made with a lot of teachers and pupils last year in April to five Dutch secondary schools and four German schools that there was no school where uh, there were only kids from the very beginning from Montessori till the end. So at almost all the schools there were a lot of pupils who came in and even at my school it's the only school in a town and it's a school working towards Montessori identity. It's an ongoing process where we talk in Holland with the other schools about what should really be the characteristics. We visit each other, we give each other feedback. So it's, it's a, not a Montessori school. We bought some land, but we still do not have a farming school and things, you know, it's in an urban <coughs> environment. But uh, even at uh, our school, I see very funny things. For example, uh, not all our education is no free. Uh, we, we try to do a lot of things the right way, but that we see that often quite Montessori kids, they, are, they really like to, 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 for the first time, if they get a, a kind of note with uh, example, with the uh, 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 with comments of the teachers and other kids. So uh, it's the, the other kids great. also fit in quickly very well into right. different systems, and you can work on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Remember, we're, I'm setting up a time of friendliness with error. Please talk about your errors. Yeah. So just talking about your successes isn't going to help any of us to grow. So, yes. One of the errors, and we are the school you are talking about. We, have, we are a school in the Netherlands. We really want to be a public school, and we really want to give uh, state exams. So, uh, the diplomas we give are valid in our country. Um, we have 750 children. Um, but when they come in, only a small fraction, really, really, really small fraction uh, is coming from a Montessori uh, primary uh, school. Uh, the other kids uh, don't have what you would call um, this intrinsic wheel of knowing how to work and uh, plan their work or keep themselves uh, curious. Uh, a lot of them uh, are very curious about just sitting and writing or listening and not doing things. Uh, so we do really struggle with your question. Uh, we do not have the answer. We are trying to every day and we are doing a lot of tests in this, uh, in this field. We are testing out a new idea next year to prepare the environment more with little pieces of information and different ways to obtain that information. Um, but we, we do not have the answer. We are really struggling it, and we are definitely an example of a big school that is trying to be Montessori, but in our own view, we, we're not succeeding as we hoped we would. Please remember, we know that Montessori herself also had <laughs> some things that did work out and hence changed and changed. So we want to embrace what they're saying. Is it true that um, no attrition is good? Imagine the same 30 kids all the way through for 14 years. Is, is, is that a, a useful model? Is that um, the way we want to see our school? So that's one question to ask about. Are all children who go through Montessori primary, uh, elementary programs, are they all perfectly normalized? Are they just fantastic wonder beings? Is that, no. is that uniformly true? No. We have to just ask that question as well. Are there kids who can go through other schools and have parents or other experiences that open them up to this world view that exists in the, on the planet that have never heard of the word Montessori, but somehow have embraced many, many of those attributes? So maybe the question of the label is the problem. What the label Montessori child looks like. I want to share another reflection, is that I'm not convinced that the 12 to 15 has a natural characteristic of curiosity. I don't think they jump up and down about the world. Unless it falls totally into their lap, and unless it's kind of irritating or frustrating or, or, or perhaps uh, amazing, they're not necessarily going to be driven after. I think the 6 to 12, absolutely little details, oh, 12 to 15 is a different 
energy level. So to, don't expect the planes to look similar, I think would be something I'd add. No, because they are not similar, exactly, right? Exactly, yes. Because I, I do think that the 2015 or 2016 that I work with, they are curious when they know it's relevant to them mm -hmm. and when they know that they can have an impact and they can be in charge of their life and what they're doing, then they're very happy to do work, especially work that is manual. <coughs> and as they get older, they are more interested in the academics, so to speak, behind this manual work. They will do the academics earlier too, if it's relevant to the project or whatever work they are doing. But then later they just take pleasure in just doing astronomy because they're just interested in astronomy and they will find someone who will an expert to lecture to them on astronomy and it's not related to any physical work whatsoever but they will still enjoy it. But the younger adolescents, they are really eager and have the energy to work and there I think it depends very much on the environment they are in. And I don't think that that's in a second plane environment wouldn't be, it's not sufficient for them. They want a different environment, just as an adolescent environment is not, I mean, a, a mental child would be happy there either. So just to finish that off, in terms of attrition, I think that generally people <laughs> are, are saying, yes, they are accepting lateral <coughs> but that seems to be an okay model, perhaps initially to start off with. Um, and also your second question about um, attrition and taking those guys in, it has to work for the school and local government. And I think ultimately, we all have to run for government. I'm sorry about it, but we all have to change from the top as well as from the bottom. Yeah. And was there another question that we could just suggest? There's sound from next door too that's kind of competing. Everyone can hear Stephen. Alright, I have to shout then. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add, because I was thinking about your question. I yeah, thank you so much. I I my experience is you know, it all depends on the child coming into your environment. And it also depends on the children you already have in your environment and how they embrace and take on those new uh, friends joining the environment. I personally think that, you know, what you are presented with, you have to work with. And I never ever refused a child to come to our school and I never ever sort of it's a word coach someone to leave the school leader. Um, what I found though is that it has been easier for an adolescent or a child joining the adolescent community than the elementary community. Because the adolescent community, they are sort of, that they are now sort of creating their new social being. So they are all working on that, and it's therefore, and because it's a lot of physical work, they are. It's easier to, I think, join that community. That has been my experience. Than to join the working elementary community. So part of what you just said, I think, maybe love and peace. Can we just remember these two words? Where there is no love, let me bring the love. I think all children um, benefit from a monster environment, and if you're in a position be able to offer that, and I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and how are we going to get a world of peace if we only take the guys who get through in a zero, straight out of the uterus, and they get it, <laughs> we've got a limit on it, and maybe we need to think about that. Sometimes yes. <laughs> there are challenges. And I know you had a question over here, was there a question? Um, yes. Just as you were speaking about um, the curiosity and it made me think Montessori's terminology with the economy of words and economy of movement sounds like the adolescent has an economy of energy from the student's point of view. Yes. Just yeah, that's a nice little that. thought. Thank you. Was there another comment over here? Yes. I was perhaps uh, heading to, to your question. I don't know whether we close it already or not, but uh, I guess we are in the same situation, sort of. We got uh, 300 kids, and it is one of the challenges for us as well. Uh, we got our elementary, which is, let's say, full Montessori without uh, any doubts. They are working with the kids uh, almost uh, older, five or six years, which they are with. 
and then they are switching to our to our middle school and I would say we can cope with it as a school but it is completely different uh, experience for the parents and uh, for us it is quite difficult that they are afraid that they will lose what they obtain during these five years that they will be mixture with the majority of non-Montessori uh, this is a different type of the school these kids never work with the materials so they don't have this need so it is quite difficult to communicate with them that we are still kind of Montessori and they are questioning is it Montessori at all because it is completely not completely but uh, quite different experience that they had at upper elementary so it is challenge especially how to communicate it with the with the parents so education is the result of our work not what our work is and I think that's really important we listen to what Jenny was saying about um, our role, and remember the Montessori method, if we're allowed to use the word method, is just three words long, let's follow the child, that's, that's the deal. <laughs> All the rest is just how. Mm. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I just wanted to voice my own beliefs, I think it's, I, I just wanted to do that, and, and the belief is that every child, even though they did not follow a Montessori education previously, has in him or her uh, a Montessori curiosity or Montessori child in there. It might be dormant because it's never been spoken to or it, it never got the chance to uh, do the things other children did. And I think it's our job to um, <coughs> reawaken it or find it or activate it. And I think that is a challenge because we don't, I, I'm not talking about children that are joining a community. The community we get is not uh, the bigger percentage are children that did, that did not have a uh, Montessori education. Oh, can I pass oh, yes. that? Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to reassure you, because uh, throughout the years, my experience, our experience is that we have uh, taught our kids for about five years, and even, even if it's a struggle to get them through those years, what we hear from universities where they go to or following educations they follow, what we hear is that they say, yeah, your pupils are independent, they're curious. So without even knowing that they are curious, they, they have or they learn things, um, whereas we think they don't do anything at all during the period they are with us. As if they, in the environment we, we offer them, even more than the subjects we offer them, we already did the environment, teaches enough to get them going later on in life. And I think that's what we are aiming at, aren't we? So the time of this meeting so far is um, one of acceptance. And perhaps the bravery is when you invite somebody from our principal into your school and you're sitting there, ah, what sort of judgment, how will people rate me? Am I Montessori enough? And maybe part of the networking is to build up enough faith in ourselves and in the work we're doing and in each other so that we can have that base of acceptance to start off with. Because I kind of think that's what peace and love are about actually, is acceptance of difference. Not just tolerance, but acceptance. And um, I think principals sitting here who are worried about being judged is not good enough, or teachers who are thinking, I'm trying hard here, but um, maybe we can have a big group hug in that respect and just to respect everybody, <laughs> but with that not have an excuse to settle for. Because if it's wrong, let's get it more and more right, even if we know we can never get it right mm. in that sense. Um, so let, let's just open that, that sort of spirit of collegiality, which I think this workshop is about, eh? Yeah. Good <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I, I'm from USA, but I moved to Turkey four years ago, and I have a uh, preschool. And we are moving up to uh, open the, the higher levels too. But the Turkey is such a country that they focus on the test, not the learning. So uh, we, I talked to a lot of parents. They are asking me if we are going to open the higher level too. But in the future, and when they are 8th grades and 12th grade, they have to answer the, the test uh, in Turkey if they can pass it. Their life is kind of like, okay, they have to figure it out. So they have high concern with Montessori method. Are they going to be able to pass the test? So how we can cope yeah. with that? Because even explaining it, not really. 
you know, so they are they want evidence, but in Turkey we don't have that. We can show it yet. It's gonna be the, you know uh, in the process of uh, going by now. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to uh, solve this problem? Right. Um, I think it's the question about trust mm -hmm. on behalf of the parents, and we had one year a parent and the father was well is very very academic and he was you know very concerned about his son and um, not getting all the academics maybe that he would or that he needed if he went to the farm but he said he said jenny he said they our children have been to your school since Children's House. Okay. Children's House did a great job. They really enjoyed Children's House and, and, and we had children who enjoyed learning the same for elementary. They really enjoyed <coughs> elementary and we can see that they developed in many different areas and not socially and when it came to the traditional, well, he considered the school subjects and so forth. So he said, so I'm willing to give it a try because so far your school has been good for our children and, and supported our children's development. And so we trust that what was, we felt that the school has been right about children's science and elementary and now we trust that it will be right for the adolescent too. So we will send our son and then we will see. But we trust that it will work out. And then the son stayed there for four years. Can we add some part of the curriculum from Turkish curriculum? Because if we do that, it's not going to be too monetary. So I'm kind of planning on putting the test area too in certain hours. You know? mm -hmm. So can we do that? Because I'm kind of like afraid that it's not going to be. You know, so. <laughs> there are no Montessori police. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I also tell you, we had a parent who said, said, you know, it's sort of, I like this, she said. She had, her son was um, also in the adolescent program. And they have, we are now, by law, we have to do uh, <coughs> national tests by the ninth grade. And she said, you know, I think, my, my son, we have, he has cousins, and they, are, they have sleepless nights about the national test. They worry, their own anxieties, and my sister, she's anxious too, and they have family. And then, she says, it's Sunday evening, Alba, that was her son, comes home and says, oh, by the way, I think there is a national test tomorrow. <laughs> and then she said, oh, what subject area would that be? Because it would be science, English, math, or language. And he said, I really don't know. <laughs> and she thought, thought that was a great thing, that it was not a drama to enter a test, but that he felt comfortable and sort of prepared the way he was. And yeah, and I think that's the t kind of, environment we try to set up with the students that you know there are challenges so let's face those but it doesn't affect who i am you know can i also offer that parents are actually not the enemy no. we have to <laughs> embrace parents parents in New Zealand, we call parents as first educators. We have to go back to that. We only have students 25 hours a week. That's about a seventh of a week at traditional schools. Most of the influences are coming through from parents. By far the bigger influences, especially in adolescents, are coming through from their peers. I'm going to suggest the influence of the teaching is smaller. There's research to show that it isn't so, so, so crucial. It's massive, it's value added, it's great but the parents themselves will be looking at their own children. And that is the, um, the strongest relationship that will last a lot longer than school. So that is something we can't break by saying either choose your parenting style or choose the school style. We have to have some form of synergy, I think, between those two groups. And it is the students, our students, who speak for themselves in a way they convince their own parents. Yeah. 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 
Uh, I just wanted to to offer to help. Um, in our elementary, uh, we don't use any testing, um, and we have um, a high school. The kids at age 12 or 13, they they go to other high schools, and most of our families would like their children to go to other private high schools. It's a bit of a thing in Scotland. Um, and for those schools, they have to sit a test. And the way that we, our teachers have approached that is to, um, not in trying to teach them what is going to be in the test, but to teach them how to take a test as a practical life piece of work. And so um, they treat it as practical life, and they do practice papers, but these are like upper elementary kids. And they, they, they kind of test each other, and they make it into something that's quite enjoyable. And um, the, the children have had no issues at all. We've had quite a number of graduates now, and they've all gone on to do, like they say, it's got their first choice school. <laughs> and they're able to, and, and because they know from the, if we're following the, the Montessori curriculum, the ideas of this, this, the, the, the great stories, they've covered everything that's going to be in any test. Um, they just need to know how do you put it on the paper because it's the, you've got to put it down how the person marking it wants to read it. Right? And, and the new variable is that they have to do it on time. Yes. And I find that our students are really not used to that, mm -hmm. to do something on time. Yeah. And you have to prepare them for that. Please remember the five pillars of education is that syllabus tells you where to do it, curriculum tells you what to do it, pedagogy tells you why you're doing it, delivery tells you how, and assessment tells you what is recorded. So you can have a Montessori program that is assessed in any way you want to. Assessment is just how you take photos. So how do you take photos in your school? I don't think it should dictate how you run your educational mm -hmm. program, your pedagogy, <coughs> why do you want to offer these ideas to students, should be affected by which photos you want to take at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jenny. Yeah. Well, most of what you all just said is what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> because I am from a community where there is required testing starting at third grade. Um, and so all of our, and that's private or public. Well, private isn't exactly required, but it is such a standard that, mm -hmm. um, and it's not a problem to honor the parents' concerns about that. They have been conditioned by their own society to say that this is important. Um, but treating it like a practical life skill is exactly the way that many communities around the world are approaching it. And the other is to not think of looking at your Turkish curriculum, for example and say, oh, we now have to insert that into what we're doing. But to take this creative approach that we just heard and say, um, how do we address what these tests in a very specific way address? A little bit of when do the tests address it? But when you look at our work, what we provide in that way, usually the children at each of those stages, third grade, fifth grade, whatever, are way ahead of where the state curriculum was requiring them. And so again, the majority, if they, if they do need this skill, that for somebody else's reason, you have to do this right now, and you have two hours, and you want to get everything you know back on there. That's a skill, and I love you calling that a practical life skill. Without other questions, remember we're looking at Montessori adolescent education generally and networking ideas. I've just got a question, um, it doesn't come up often, but I think sex education is kind of ignored. Um, and why is it ignored when this is the biggest thing? We look at them as adolescents, uh, some sort of uh, uh, but they look at themselves as going from pre reproductive to post reproductive. This is the most significant change that will happen to them ever. And I wonder, I don't know if there's specific Montessori <laughs> practical life sessions. No, I don't know if we'll get that far. <laughs> Jenny saying yes, so okay, we'll go to this. I just want us to really encourage and not to be scared of those hard conversations or those slightly difficult or maybe challenging situations because actually our job is to prepare them for life. I'm going to say that sex or reproduction or whatever it is, is very important. One group of teachers, they were state teachers, were aghast when I suggested that we should mention to primary students, uh, to elementary students, that 
actually sex is about reproduction. They said, don't tell them that. <laughs> Whoa. No, they didn't see the reproduction side at all. They saw the fun, the glamour, the glitz, the sexualization, but had missed the reproduction component. And I kind of think that, um, yes, farm schools, and I'm sure it becomes obvious through farm schools, yes, television, and it becomes obvious, but I also would love us to really embrace the adolescent <laughs> as a corporeal being and not just a, a sort of a mindset that we're sort of trying to teach tests, um, that they actually need a whole lot of life lessons. I, I can offer how we, we, we address that uh, through, we call it human development, and uh, we ask the A to I adult to talk about human development, and adolescents are really fascinated, and especially if they also get to observe in the infant community mm. and, and write down their observations and they will ask questions. When I was one and a half, could I make a dough? You know, and they are really surprised with what younger children can, can accomplish. And I think it's done because they have their timelines, they talk about reproduction, and it's done in a gentle and very nice way that is Obvious to everyone. So. Thank you. I think one of the dominant narratives around sex at the moment is in gender and these multiple forms of gender and multiple forms of sexuality. And I think maybe reproduction is just being lost in that conversation a little bit. So I think as Montessori people, we want to get away from the curriculum. Mm. I mean, let's say that. But um, yes, it has 